Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry. I'm a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. There's probably a good chance that in the aftermath of last night's presidential debate, that it was one of the most embarrassing moments in not just U.S. debate history, but U.S. political history. And as you might be thinking about that, I thought it'd be a good chance to review the top most embarrassing U.S. presidential moments. So let's check this out as we are thinking about the potential ramifications of this 2024 presidential race. All right, let's check this out. Now, if you know me, you know I'm all about historical context. And anytime we make claims or anything of events that are going to have a place in history, it is important to compare those things with actual history. So let's see if the current controversy matches up with other embarrassing things from history. All right, Nixon. Oh, we'll see what we got. An unraveling of a presidency begins here. It begins right in this space. Welcome to Watch what? Mojo. Watergate. Today, we're counting down our picks All right, for the most questionable thinks. decisions and politically fraught moments. And I want to know what you think. Smears on the legacy of U.S. presidents. 120,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans within oh, four months camps. were put into barracks. I mean, how does that World happen? War II. Number 20, that makes George it. W. Bush, mission accomplished speech. Uh -oh. In May 2003, six weeks after invading Iraq, President George W. Bush gave a speech in front of a mission accomplished banner, declaring the end of major combat operations in the country. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. Now, that messaging was very interesting because obviously that was not going to be the end. There was going to be plenty of intervention for years and years after that. Remember, uh, political campaigning is always a thing. A politician has to do their job while always campaigning. This was in 2003. So the uh, so so Saddam Hussein had been removed, but we know the United States presence was going to be there forever. Now, the first uh, uh, time that President Bush was elected was in 2000. He had a, another election coming in 2004. And as you know, your country has to be appearing like it's in a very good state when you're going to campaign, especially for someone like the president. And you wonder if jumping the gun with the whole mission accomplished thing had those political motives going into a new election. What do you think about that? However, the conflict was far from over. In many ways, it had only just begun. Plus, the war went on for another eight years, with the majority of deaths occurring after this speech. When the criticism began pouring in, the Bush administration claimed the banner was requested by the Navy. They then stated that mission accomplished only referred to the initial invasion, not the war. This incident <laughs> echoed earlier misinformation. It's by like, the what is that? But, but what's the point, Iraq's right? Alleged possession of weapons of mass destruction, despite hardly any intelligence supporting such claims. What justifies everything is the removal of a threat. I mean, Saddam was saying weapons are no weapons, which would have been a threat had he remained in power. Number 19. Uh, that's interesting because the, um, the you know, that, that stake is originally going in. Uh, the war and everything that supported the efforts for uh, funding it and supporting it, you know, it came from Congress, was based upon the idea of weapons of mass destruction being in Iraq. And those were, you know, never found. And, you know, if you're like President Bush or, you know, a politician in general, sometimes they might. I don't know if you call it moving the goalposts, but whatever it is, it's like, okay, well, even if there weren't, you know, weapons of mass destruction, destruction, it was still a good thing to remove you know, whatever threat from power. I don't know. What do you think about that? All right. Washington, he's supposed to be the goat. Whiskey Rebellion. Let's see. What we got. George Washington, the Whiskey Rebellion. In 1791, just two years into his presidency, we need George a, Washington's administration enacted early what became known as the Whiskey Tax. In Not anticipating history. the hostilities to follow, Congress passed the Excise Whiskey Tax of 1791. <laughs> its ripple effects would be far-reaching and incite violent division. Proposed by Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton, its aim was to generate revenue to tackle the national debt incurred during the Revolutionary War. This tax faced staunch opposition from small farmers who deemed it unfair since they had to distill their grain into whiskey for easier transport and sale. They're like, our country is new. We've only been around for like a decade since the end of the, the Revolutionary War. And now we're getting new taxes and stuff. Are like, are we becoming the baddies? Plus, it's alcohol. No one wants to pay more for alcohol. Okay, we already saw with Prohibition, famously, how uh, kind of crazy things were with that. And uh, interestingly, one of the reasons that Prohibition was ended was to raise revenue during the Great Depression. One thing we know about people, we tried to be legislated and all those things. People want to drink, and they're going to do whatever it takes. So, boys, we'll make some revenue off it, right? 
The backlash quickly turned violent, with farmers refusing to pay and even attacking tax collectors. Pennsylvania farmers lashed out against collectors, tarring and feathering them in certain instances. In response, Washington (laughs) personally led an army to quash the protests. The rebels all fled, and no conflict ensued. While Washington managed to suppress resistance to federal laws, the tax failed to achieve its goal and was repealed in 1802. It's amazing because it sounds so much like what the British were doing after the Seven Years' War and the French and Indian War, which was trying to get revenue back from so much money being spent during war. It's like the United States spent a fortune, you know, having to fight the British for those years and then having to find ways to catch up that revenue will always be uh, always be, you know, rejected by the people because people don't want to, you know, deal with that. All right. Number 18. Grover. Grover Cleveland sex scandal. Because that's exactly what you think of with Grover Cleveland, right? You look at that guy and you go, dude, that guy was raking it in. (laughs) During the presidential elections of 1884, Democratic candidate Grover Cleveland was seen as a formidable option, earning voter support for his anti-corruption stance. Grover Cleveland, known as Grover the Good to his supporters, easily won his party's nomination for president in July of 1884. However, in the lead up to the election, allegations surfaced that Cleveland had fathered an illegitimate child with a widow named Maria Halpin. Halpin claimed that Cleveland Sex sexually assaulted her as old as and had her committed to an insane asylum and put their child up for adoption. When the scandal became public, Cleveland admitted to paying Halpin child support. This time, his staff didn't even bother to deny that he and Halpin had previously been what they described as illicitly acquainted. His opponents seized upon the controversy, creating the chant, Ma, Ma, Where's My Pa, which dogged Cleveland's campaign. Despite the shocking sex scandal, Cleveland's supporters remained loyal, helping him secure a narrow victory at the polls. Number 17. Uh, wanted to add some uh, another interesting con- uh, context there, because those sexual, you know, controversies not new, right? Been going on forever <laughs> with people and uh, people in power. But uh, Grover Cle- Cleveland's also interesting because... Um, if President Trump, okay, for President Trump wins this 2024 election, him and Grover Cleveland are actually going to have something in common. And that will be the only presidents to serve a term and then serve a second term, but not consecutively with their first term, meaning there was a term in between. It would be the only presidents to do that. All right, George H.W. Bush. Oh, yeah. Read my lips. No new taxes. And then what happens? George H.W. Yes. Bush, no new taxes. By now, voters have grown accustomed to politicians failing to fulfill their campaign promises. But when a candidate centers their campaign around Everyone the key issue, that. they should probably Everyone expect loves to be lower held taxes. Or My no opponent taxes. now says he'll raise them as a last resort or a third resort. But when a politician talks like that, you know that's one resort he'll be checking into. <laughs> that was precisely the case with President George H.W. Bush. Throughout his 1988 campaign, Bush consistently pledged not to introduce any new taxes if elected. He emphasized this commitment at the Republican National Convention, stating, Read my lips. No new taxes. <laughs> yeah! well, guess what? There were, in fact, several new taxes. Bush's backtrack on this promise lost him the support of many within his party and became a focal point of the 1992 election, where Bill Clinton successfully portrayed him as untrustworthy. This ultimately contributed... <laughs> Clinton's like, I mean, I, I'm going to raise some taxes. So I, I, I'm not going to say I'm not. It's like it's not fully always in your hands. I mean, yes, the pre- president can veto certain things, but we know that doesn't always happen. So, yeah, that's one thing, man. If you don't make uh, campaign promises, it is fodder absolute fodder for your um for your opponent and let's be honest when you look at presidential history how many have fully made do on every promise that they make especially when you make promises that they can't control you know what i mean Bitted to his re-election defeat number 16 thomas jefferson the embargo act during the Napoleonic Wars, America sought to remain neutral. Economic controversy. Pressure from Britain and France to join the conflict. Another European war threatened to spill across the Atlantic. Thanks, Napoleon. As France and Britain once again battled it out. When the British began forcing U.S. sailors to join their navy, President Thomas Jefferson decided to sign the Embargo Act of 1807, which halted all American exports abroad. 
Jefferson hoped this would pressure Britain and France to respect American neutrality. Instead, this strategy backfired, as the act negatively affected the U.S. economy, leading yeah. to widespread smuggling and protests. What's amazing is that this has happened many times in, in, in American history. This idea of you try to like punish another country or grow your own economy with this idea that you're just going to buy and sell American goods. And it's like every time that happens, it ends up being a problem because if you, you know, uh, uh, don't keep healthy trade agreements with other countries, then trade comes down. If you are going to like, let's say, put a tariff, which means uh, basically like an import tax um, to try to encourage the buying of, of, of uh, American goods. What that always seems to result in is other countries will do the same to you, which halts trade and uh, lack of foreign trade is historically been very bad for Americans uh, because you want to sell your stuff. And if you can get better prices, right, by selling overseas, then people are going to want to do that. It was one of the big grievances that people had against the British during the colonial era was the Americans unable to export and do business with other countries when they could get better prices. Now, what that usually uh, results in is smuggling, which is illegal trade. So you find ways to trade whether it's indirectly or directly, just through some uh, some more secretive means. And these usually have economic ramifications. One of the other times that you, you saw something like this happen was the Smoot Halley Tariff Act in in uh, the great during the Great Depression to try to grow the economy by not, you know, uh, uh, buying foreign goods. And what it did is actually brought down global trade, especially in the New England region. All Therefore, Marco manages to do is to cause an economic depression. This was particularly damaging for America, which was a relatively new nation. But often at the sounds time. really good Faced on Faced with service. growing opposition, Jefferson quietly repealed the By American, the last don't deal business with your enemies. Number 15, Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson. Espionage and Ash. Ooh, SP yeah, a couple things. Wilson, man, gets a lot of hate in the historical community. This is World War One stuff. So that's one thing you're going to see a lot of potentially with with uh, some of these controversial moments is certain things that are done during war that, you know, would never fly if it was during peacetime. Many pre every every major war we've had has had something like this. Espionage Act and Sedition Act. America's entry into World War I in April 1917, after nearly three years of neutrality, was met with significant domestic dissent. To suppress this opposition, President Woodrow Wilson signed two laws, the Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918. But the most memorable provisions of the Espionage Act regulated anti-war speech and made it a federal offense to say or do or publish things that would interfere with the war effort. So the increase, so you got Espionage Act, first off, so that means, you know, it's gonna be increased surveillance and stuff. People don't like that. People don't like, you know, Big Daddy there. And then Sedition Acts, which is, you know, speaking out negatively towards the government or war efforts and able to try to keep peace and stability during wartime. You know, things that would never, never fly uh, during peace times uh, because, it, these are like cherished beliefs by people. But during wartime, people have tended to loosen up a little bit on those things and see them as things that are required for war. Fast forward to, say, like the Patriot Act being passed during uh, um, uh, during the wars in the Middle East in, in the early 2000s. Um, things like this that, you, again, you wouldn't see probably happen at other times. And the other thing that added to this with with Wilson was the fact that, you know, he had won re-election during World War One and had campaigned heavily on the United States staying out of the war in the first place. So not only are they getting involved in the war, which anti-war people are already going to not like, but then you have these other things that people saw as violations of civil liberties on top of that even further is going to make that even more as this video is titled, you know, embarrassing for the president. The espionage in the eyes of originally those aims to crack down on actual espionage by penalizing interference in foreign policy and military operations. However, the Sedition Act greatly expanded its scope, prohibiting disloyal speech against the U.S. government, which seems to violate the Constitution's and free speech protections. And it's always These very acts vague. resulted in widespread prosecutions targeting socialists and pacifists, yeah. including notable figures like Eugene V. Debs. Eugene, Debs. Eugene V. Debs was arrested. Uh, he was tried under the Espionage and, and Sedition Acts. He was sentenced to 10 years uh, in the 
in prison. The Sedition Act was ultimately- Eugene Debs, uh, interestingly as well. So again, he was a socialist by, especially by American terms at that time. Uh, he ran for president while from prison ran for president while he was in prison there and actually took a ton of votes um, in that election. So interesting. Another thing, if for somehow, you know, if, if, if it somehow happens where like uh, Donald Trump is put into prison, you can run for president from prison. And I think just like, you know, Debs did is just my own take there. I think it would still get a lot of votes. And dare I say, become threatening for a, a winner from prison? I don't know. Like, what do you guys think about that? Could someone like Pres President Trump, you think, win an election from prison if that was the case? Uh, depending on the circumstances, of course, who's the opponent, you know, timing and all that stuff. But uh, that's an interesting thought. I I'd love to get your uh, opinion down below. Lee repealed in 1920, but the Espionage Act remains in effect today. Number 14, John Adams. The Alien Another and Sedition, Sedition Act. Act. Woodrow Alien Wilson Act, wasn't yeah. the only president to suppress dissent against the government. Back in 1798, President John Adams enacted four laws called the Alien and Sedition Acts amid <laughs> concerns of an imminent war with France. The Alien Bill made it difficult for people to become U.S. citizens and allowed the president to throw any foreigners he wanted out of the country. You feel like American country. history just... The sedition cycles and cycles and cycles further. with issues. It made it a it's like as much change to even since the 1700s. Their government. These acts targeted immigrants and political dissidents who Adams feared would side with France in the event of war. Among the four laws, three were alien acts, which toughened the citizenship process for immigrants and allowed their deportation if deemed dangerous. The fourth, a sedition act, punished anyone spreading false and malicious statements about the government. They were repressive acts. And Adams supported this legislation, which then just created this enormous debate within American society about what freedom of press, freedom of speech really meant. Naturally, these acts faced strong public <laughs> opposition. <laughs> this drawing is awesome. Look at every, look at their faces. They're so, these are scary. I like in this dude in the kind of the top left. Oh my gosh, look at these. Is this different? Is this this 1700s version of like political parties today? Sparking protests nationwide. This backlash provided leverage for Adams's opponent, Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, who successfully capitalized on it and won the presidential election in 1800. Number 13. And they did their own controversial things. Everybody just has their own own uh, own brand of that. So anyways. Dean. Andrew Johnson, ah, Reconstruction and Impeachment. Abraham Lincoln's assassination left Andrew Johnson with the task of reintegrating former Confederate states and previously enslaved people into the United States. Johnson wanted the post-war South. You know, his his uh, appointing or whatever as a, as a running mate, you know, because he was not the original, um, he was not uh, the original vice president in the first term. So like him coming in there, he was seen as somebody maybe a little bit more moderate that might expand the voting base for people that were very critical of um of of president lincoln as kind of like a southerner but not like the deep southerner but not you know like lincoln and the, the very much a yankee northerner and you know political appointees those things are actually uh very very common um for people that especially for presidents or candidates that feel like they have their margins are very narrow and need to expand their voting bases Appointing certain types of vice presidents they hope can open up new demographics. Another one that came to my mind was with JFK and uh, with Lyndon B. Johnson, with LBJ. LBJ was uh, seen as like uh, more progressive at that time, like a more progressive Democrat than many people in the South because he's from Texas and trying to get that voting base. He did leniently. As for the fate of freed slaves, he wanted that left up to the states. Johnson's reconstruction policies favored leniency towards the rebels, allowing them to easily rejoin the Union and uphold a system that was essentially still slavery. These policies enraged Congress, which passed laws to counter them, kicking off a bitter struggle with the president. In August 1867, Johnson fired Secretary of War Edward Stanton in violation of the Tenure of Office Act. The following year, Congress impeached Johnson, making him the first president to face such a resolution. Finally, the bad blood spilled over. Not removed from office. The president though. was impeached and escaped removal from office by just one, one vote. vote. Although he was narrowly acquitted by the Senate. Good, Johnson, another interesting comparison. Uh, president uh, Trump twice 
right? Had that not removed from office. So, you know, the power of impeachment is kind of interesting because it's like it exists, but it has never resulted in removal of people from uh, from from power. People wonder uh, with Nixon, would he have done that? You know, he had stepped down after Watergate. Would he have actually been removed from office? Have you guys ever thought about that? What do you think? Presidency was severely weakened and he failed to win the Democratic nomination in 1868. Number 12, James Buchanan, his entire, <laughs> entire presidency. presidency. <laughs> Uh, people say so like those presidents leading up to Lincoln get so much criticism for not addressing really the, the the slavery issue as it was obviously growing and it was going to be a problem because remember this is all happening during Western expansion the more territory you get the more decisions you're gonna have to make about what the future of slavery is going to be in the United States because you have to have slave laws in certain you know uh, in new territories as you make them territories or states or whatever it is and and presidents up to this point and of course through Buchanan were just trying to do a balancing act of you know trying to keep things even and all that and just delaying the inevitable so I'm sure that's what they're going to go in on on Buchanan here James Buchanan's single term as president occurred in the mid 19th century since then many successors have come and gone yet several historians still consider him the worst president in u.s history <laughs> he was elected president i have heard in 1856 i've seen him on the top of this a lot of lists democrats yeah. sympathies with the slave holding south exacerbated long simmering tensions this is due to his apparent indifference to the impending civil war after his inauguration buchanan viewed slavery as an issue of little importance Instead of trying to lessen the rift between the North and the South, Buchanan believed he shouldn't interfere in states' issues. He feared that if you handled the issue of slavery too robustly, that it would create what he believed would be the end of the Union, secession. He had pledged not to I mean, to he wasn't wrong there. I mean, once... Once you started getting, you know, candidates at, at, that were pushing more and more towards it, it doesn't even have to be abolition of slavery, but something that doesn't protect it or help it expand or something, uh, whatever it is. I mean, he was right about that for a second term. And during the lame about to get period between his successor's <laughs> so. election and inauguration, southern states began to secede. Buchanan essentially crossed his arms and watched them leave his incompetence inevitably resulting in the Civil War. Number 11. Warren G. Harding, the Teapot Dome Scandal. Ah, President Warren G. Harding was in office for only two years before his business untimely corruption. death. But in that little time, he was involved in one of the most shocking political scandals ever. <laughs> the Teapot Dome Scandal was the probably the most significant presidential scandal Oil. in uh, American history in the 20th century up until Watergate. Following his inauguration in 1921, yeah. Harding placed his close friends in high-ranking positions, including Albert B. Fall, whom he appointed as Interior Secretary. Secretary. Harding gave Secretary Fall control Interior. over three naval oil fields, whose drilling rights the Secretary then leased to private oil companies in exchange for bribes. Now, yeah, <laughs> this is going to be incredibly corrupt economically here, uh, because they basically pronounced that they had this lease of land and wine Wyoming that had the largest oil reserves or just, you know, oil located in that land of like anywhere in the country. So this that got people excited that way. reported Investors. in April 1922, resulting in a Senate investigation. Congress ordered President Harding to scrap the oil leases. The Supreme Court ruled the leases fraudulent and said Harding's transfer of authority from the Navy to Interior was illegal. At the time of his death in August 1923, Harding was beloved among the American public. But as the details of this investigation surfaced, his reputation was effectively tarnished. Number 10. Do you feel like do you feel like presidents were held to more accountability the further back in history you go? Do you think it was not the case? Do you think they're more accountable now? What do you think about that? All right. We're getting into modern stuff. All right, so we got uh, Donald Trump's felonies. Okay, let's see what we got. Donald Trump, convicted of felony crimes. Before Donald Trump's election in 2016, 44 individuals had served as president of the United States. Yet in 2024, he made history as the first one to be convicted of a crime. The stunning verdict was delivered by a Manhattan jury of seven men and five women who deliberated for two days, making Mr. Trump the first former American president to be convicted of a crime. The landmark case stemmed from hush money payments Trump made to adult film star Stormy Daniels to keep... And that happened 
before he was president like the the stormy daniel stuff was leading up to it so that was something that was you know pre 2016 essentially going into 2016 but then not you know actually like uh, uh convicted upon and, and and finalized upon for geez almost almost 10 years huh keep their alleged sexual encounter under wraps. The prosecution argued like that Grover Trump falsified business records to conceal these payments, a felony under New York law. The trial became a media spectacle and concluded with the jury finding Trump guilty on all 34 counts. This case was one of several criminal charges Trump faced, including his alleged involvement in the January 6th insurrection aimed at overturning the 2020 election, which he lost to Joe Biden. After this, we're going to walk down and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down anyone you want. But I think right here, we're going to walk down to the Capitol. Number nine. Okay. Bill. So that obviously comes into context with what led me to, you know, cover in this video today is, you know, about the, the, the debate. And it seems like from how, how so many people are responding that people feel very low about the candidates, both candidates, right. And in, in the large kind of scheme of things, one, you have right. This, this, uh, president, like they were saying, that's the only one that's been convicted of crimes, but at the other side of that, people also talk about that. It's, it's, it's a, uh, politically motivated thing and, you know, wouldn't have happened if, uh, if, if he wasn't running for president, like, you know, those kind of things, but at the same time you have the, the performance of, uh, of president Biden, which people are talking about being one of the most embarrassing things again not just in, in in presidential history but or debate history but presidential history it's why i'm trying to add some context to other embarrassing moments and stuff like that but they had that put at 10 right there like at 10 is it too soon is there enough time to talk about literally things that are unfolding right now i mean they put at 10 and i don't know how much you put into these like rankings from a, a normie site like this but what do you think about this context of this uh, of this election and what's happened with you know President Trump, just based off of those things, the the, the convictions and and allegations and, and the other legal issues, in the context of these other presidential moments that are seen as embarrassing that we're watching as we go on. That's kind of one of the things trying to get uh, everyone to kind of think about um, for themselves. Where do you think that al aligns with these other moments? Bill Clinton. The Lewinsky All right, so yeah, obviously another fairly modern, embarrassing Number one. nine, Bill Clinton. Monica the Lewinsky Lewin. scandal and impeachment. Another case of century adulterous behavior. Johnson's impeachment in 1868. And lying Bill under Clinton oath. Became the second U.S. president to be impeached by Congress in 1998. When the dust had cleared, the House, voting almost strictly along party lines, sent two articles of impeachment on for trial in the Senate. Clinton's impeachment was related to an extramarital affair he had with White House intern Monica Lewinsky. Lewinsky confided in her colleague Linda Tripp, who secretly recorded their conversations and handed the tapes to an independent counsel, which was already investigating Clinton on other matters. The ensuing scandal eventually led to his impeachment by the House of Representatives on charges of perjury and obstruction of justice. This seemed like more politically motivated things where these things are, are brought out with the intention of you know, trying to hurt a candidate, their reelection or their stance or something like that, that if, you know, these people weren't in certain positions of power or going for elections that would largely ignored <laughs> in a cynical way too. do you think things like this happen, especially you, we've seen all these like adultery scandals and stuff. How common do you think they actually are? Like some people are like, yeah, this is probably like what every president or most presidents do. It's just getting caught. As he had lied under oath. What do you think about, about that? Affair. I want the American people to know today that I am still committed to working with people of good faith and goodwill of yeah, both Hillary. parties. To do Hillary stuck with him. Country. Though Clinton was ultimately acquitted by the Senate, the scandal left a lasting stain on his legacy. Number eight. John F. Kennedy. <laughs> Be a pigs. Anyway, I don't know if there's much more to say about the whole like the like Clinton and and uh, like sexual affairs and stuff that you're seeing by some of these. And speaking of that, we got Kennedy, right? He was accused a lot of of doing that stuff as well. But how relevant do you think that stuff actually is in changing voter opinions? Like that stuff. I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like in the end, people. If you're already into a candidate or you're against a candidate, I don't think that moves the needle much. Does it do for people that just aren't, 
aware enough or usually don't care enough about these, you know, about these things that it gets them activated. I mean, maybe what do you guys think about that? What, what kind of actual actions from presidents do you think really moves the needle in people changing their own like future votes and stuff like that? What percentage of people actually will change because of things like that? Okay. I mean, there's major things and stuff, but I don't know. Maybe you wouldn't consider those things we we're talking about with Clinton or, or Trump and the infidelity is like you know, major things. Depends on you, I guess. But anyway, Bay of Pigs. Ooh, yeah. The Bay of Pigs invasion definitely would be on In a list. Early 1960, and President high up. Dwight Eisenhower approved a CIA plan to overthrow Cuban leader Fidel Castro. That plan was not executed until the following year, after John F. Kennedy he inherited office. that. On April plan. 16th, Kennedy reluctantly was already in agreed to the plan, with one major exception. If the operation foundered for the Cuban exiles, the U.S. military would not intervene. On April 17, 1961, over 1,400 Cuban exiles, who had been trained by the U.S., landed at the Bay of Pigs to launch a full-scale invasion. However, a their attempt was a coup attempt. dead on arrival. The insurgents on the ground were met with unexpected resistance by Castro's forces and were easily overpowered, yep. especially after Kennedy withheld further air support. Within three days, they had all surrendered. These are 1,400 men. Castro's army is 25,000. The real story here is these desperate men on the beach watching their chances go away. And back in the White House, Kennedy suffering mightily with what to do about this. The fiasco became a significant embarrassment for Kennedy, undermining his credibility in the international community and escalating Cold War tensions. Number seven. Okay, uh, there's definitely more to say. So that, it's a coup attempt. They were trying to, just recently, okay, just a couple years before that, you had the Cuban Revolution that led to the overthrow of an American prop dictator named Batista. And then you got this communist, you know, revolution essentially, and you get Fidel Castro in power. So this was a coup attempt to basically take him out of power. Um, something, you know, the United States has had done and did after as well in other places around the world. Uh, usually though to success, but this one, one of those was one of those, you know, handful of, uh, a handful of failures. So this had been already kind of planned and already uh, going in back to the, the Eisenhower administration. And then Kennedy gets wind of it. And when he comes into office and is like, all right, let's, let's go ahead and do it. So they train these exiles and um, the, the, um, the, the actual operation already got leaked. Um, they didn't really mention that, but it was already leaked. Like I believe through the press, right? Wasn't it the was it the New York Times or something? Or some somebody had basically spilled the beans, and it had gotten to Cuba, and Castro, of course, was was totally prepared for it. But this is one of those things that was seen as you know maybe it's high risk, high reward, whatever it is. But yeah, it uh, is going to begin the escalation of putting the uh, the the Cold War to its most tense time it ever was. Because after the Bay of Pigs invasion. This was seen as a pretty big moment for the Cubans in the eyes of the Soviet Union under Khrushchev. They like saw that because uh, they didn't really have a relationship, like much of a direct relationship at all at that time, Soviet Union and Cuba. And it brought that relationship a lot closer and made things a lot more tense, especially for Americans um, having now a communist state which automatically made them an enemy of, of the u.s plus with now the soviet union is going to be coming in and this is when you're going to start to see leading up to eventually the cuban missile crisis because that relationship is going to get tighter between those countries to eventually the soviet union seeing cuba as as an ally and somebody that they could hopefully deter uh, uh american aggression by you know putting you know, potential attack or offensive weapons like they were like they were doing there, just like the United States had in Turkey. And but that's another, you know, for the Cuban Missile Crisis. But you can see that. But it was a major blow in the face. But Kennedy was still a quite a popular president, you know, despite this stuff. Evan, Herbert Hoover, All right, Hoover, Mexican repatriation. Shortly after Herbert Hoover took office in 1929, the U.S. stock market crashed, which sparked the Great Depression. I would think Hoover's if you were going to put Hoover just like, you know, on the list, that just the stock market crash being put on him maybe would be seen as the embarrassing moment rather than the Mexican strategy to tackle this economic disaster was to blame Mexicans in the U.S., <laughs> accusing them of taking American jobs. As a result, his administration oversaw the deportation yep. of up to 1.8 million Not the first people time you hear about Mexico, this either, huh? Many of whom were actually U.S. citizens. Increasingly important is the 60% or more 
of American citizens of Mexican descent. This is one of the things that came with the debate the other night about, they were debating about, you know, immigration, of course, but what to do about uh, immigrants to, to the United States and the big debating point that they were kind of talking about and circling around, but wasn't really denied necessarily for, for Trump was um, an effort to do mass you know, potentially mass deportation. He didn't really like confirm, deny much of what that might actually look like, but not something new in history. Look at this. Go back to the 20s. In other words, what occurred here was unconstitutional deportation. 20s into the 30s. Known as the Mexican repatriation, this scheme was carried out through repatriation, age, not deportation. And pressure tactics that forced many individuals to leave voluntarily. Unsurprisingly, this did nothing to ease the Great Depression, which ended up contributing to Hubert's defeat in the next election. In 2005, the state of California formally apologized for its role in the repatriation. The state of California went on to issue a formal apology for its role in the expulsions and built a memorial in downtown Los Angeles mm -hmm. to commemorate the victims. Number six. Uh, something like that would also have big economic ramifications for a place like California, where a lot of those immigrants worked in agriculture, as California was a, a very important agriculturally to the economy of the United States, and as those people were uh, uh, largely workers in that. So, all right, Lyndon B. Johnson escalating the Vietnam War. Yes, he does escalate it. You could, you could put, I guess, embarrassing moments about the, the war <laughs> to a bunch of presidents, though. Lyndon B. Johnson. But yeah, escalating Johnson. the Vietnam War. When Lyndon Oversaw B. Johnson the height became of it. president in 1963 following JFK's assassination, the Vietnam War had already been raging for nearly a decade. And by the way, we'll see if they get this. I want to make sure this gets clear whether they talk about it or not. But it also, he had also campaigned and talked about not escalating it, as basically every president that came in during the war said that all did. We're saying there wasn't going to be, they're going to uh, uh, hope for an end to it, but something happens. And I covered a video recently about this where it's just, it seemed like they came in with these intentions. And then I don't know if they just got certain information or whatever it is that just changed their attitude that once they got in, they said, no, it actually has to be expanded. At Maybe first, wonder. American involvement was fairly limited, but this changed dramatically under Johnson. The turning point was the Gulf of Tonkin incident in 1964, where North Vietnamese forces supposedly attacked U.S. Navy ships. Johnson would use never, this incident to acquire like the that. power to make war in Vietnam whenever and however he would choose. Although this attack was later disproven, it led to the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which gave Johnson authority to escalate U.S. military actions in Vietnam. Essentially what it did was bypassed, and now this has happened now because Congress basically doesn't declare war anymore. Uh, they find ways to get around it. It's one of the most important, you know, treasured powers of Congress is the right to declare war. But the Gulf of Tonkin essentially became a declaration of war without having to go through Congress, but giving the president the ability to do so. By 1967, there were over 500,000 American troops in Vietnam, many of whom lost their lives. Johnson's escalation of the war became highly unpopular in the U.S., sparking nationwide protests and resulting in his decision not to seek re-election. I shall not see, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Number five, Ronald Reagan, Iran-Contra affair. Uh, in okay. 1986, Ronald yep. Reagan and several... Well, the thing with him, too, is he didn't have to take the fall for this. I mean, all several of his administration too. officials became embroiled in a notorious political scandal. They had secretly orchestrated the sale of weapons to Iran, which was under an arms embargo, to secure the release of seven American hostages. The profits from this sale were then... Ill so the, the, they're not giving the context, but this is Iranian Revolution, where, which um, in its throwing over the you know western-backed Shah of Iran, uh, also ended up taking over the embassy, the American embassy in Tehran, and had uh, put people under hostage. They were under hostage for a couple years. Um, this is the, uh, into the Carter administration, then into the Reagan administration. Illegally diverted to fund Contra rebels in Nicaragua, who were fighting the sale, were then illegally cure the release of seven American hostages. The profits from this sale were then illegally diverted to fund Contra rebels in Nicaragua, who were fighting the leftist Sandinista government. American President Ronald Reagan funnels money to right-wing Contra rebels, fighting an insurgency against the Sandinista government. And this was something that 
gave a lot of negative opinions there in Central America was that because once that came out that they had, you know, the Americans were indirectly supporting, you know, these uh, popular more left wing movements that were happening in, in Central America made the Americans look again like the bad guy. This was in direct violation of a congressional amendment that banned American aid to the group. When the affair was exposed, it became a major embarrassment for Reagan, raising concerns about his administration's integrity and oversight. Around the same time, Reagan also faced criticism for his delayed response to the AIDS epidemic. Now, what ended up happening, he didn't really get any consequences from that. There ended up being a fall uh, taken by, you know, like Oliver North and just like, you know, just basically saying that these weren't done at the will of the president or at the guidance of the president, these were done by other actors, you know, other people inside the American government and American military. So kind of uh, a plausible deniability of it here. So, all right, then AIDS. Yeah. 1980s uh, going into there remember AIDS, people were dying from a disease that basically nobody knew existed. And now we know of it as AIDS, but this is the height of that. Which had already been a significant crisis for years. At the time, many leaders were accused of ignoring the crisis because it was deemed a gay disease. President Reagan didn't give his first major speech on AIDS until 1987. Number four, Franklin. <laughs> they, just, they just wanted to add that at the end there. Like, do they think that was also in like number three? I wouldn't think so, but yeah. All right, Kansas Nebraska Act. All right, we're going back to the 50s, man. Oh, the old slavery. The Kansas Nebraska Act. Okay, we're getting Franklin close to the top Pierce three. What do, you, one what do you think, by the way, before it goes forward, what do you think is going to be in the top three? President is often ranked among the worst and most forgettable leaders in U.S. history. Pierce's administration is largely remembered for passing the Kansas Nebraska Act in 1854. This act created the territories of Kansas and Nebraska and allowed settlers to decide on the legality of slavery through voting. See, and that had not really been done before. It was just they would, you know, when they would admit states, they usually like admit two states, one would be a slave state, one would not. But actually having the people vote on what their own policy was going to be. Uh, it probably seemed at that time, it seems like a good idea. It's like, hey, let the people decide, right? It's a, it's a great way to deflect from not having to make tough decisions is, you know, let the people decide. It's democracy in action, right? But, you know, with Kansas, Nebraska, you're going to get the bleeding Kansas stuff. People, you know, uh, advocates on both sides of things are going to be flooding into Kansas and trying to sway votes and intimidate people. And there was violence. Signed into law, the Kansas, Nebraska Act allowing voters in the Kansas and Nebraska territories to decide whether to allow slavery within their borders, negating the earlier Missouri Compromise. Though it was intended to reduce tensions over slavery. I just gotta say, like, political cartoons used to be just so much cooler. Like, look how good that cool that looks. Without even looking at, like, the messaging of it, but it's just so, like visual and the drawings are great um, a lot of people you know talk about about this uh, about you know putting things into the hands of the states you'll see that with leaders that maybe don't want to upset a certain amount of people um, you saw like like let's say like the obama administration and, and before that where they wanted to uh, put like say gay marriage not as a federal issue by the supreme court but keep it as a state issue basically appeal to the the, the, the tenth amendment there so you had that um, and then you had, you know, of course that repeal and stuff, but then the current one right now where you have this kind of like moral issue again, like, like, like somebody had with slavery or <laughs> how people interpreted gay rights and, and that kind of thing right now is abortion rights. So that recently, right. The, the, the thing that you saw in, in, in the debate, cause it was, it was a, a big debate point that was, you knew was going to be on the, the docket of questions was, uh, what was going to be the role of each of these presidents when it comes to uh, like gay rights? And of course, with with President Trump, President Trump in his you know only one term was able to get seated three um, three Supreme Court justices that a lot of people have criticized because in their hearings, you know, one of the big things that Democrats were were putting on them in in, in the interviews was, you know, what did they think about Roe v. Wade, right? So basically federal protection to 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 uh, abortion rights. And all of them basically said that it's it's basically it's like a um, you know, something that you don't touch. Like it's it's set in stone. And then all those justices ended up you know, uh, being uh, voting into repealing that. And the idea, and you saw with, with president Trump, his, his backing of that was 
that it should be a state issue. And a lot of people, a lot of people didn't like that on both sides. On both sides, did not like that issue. And I think maybe it's a way of washing your hands from very emotionally charged arguments that somebody might not feel they can talk about publicly without either ruining their career. They don't feel confident in one way or the other, because to these people, it was like a moral, right? It's like, it needs to just be, you know, people say it needs to be allowed or it just needs to be abolished and not let people decide on this thing. But that's, I guess what you would say would be today's kind of state's rights, big issue right now. The bill backfired. Was talked about in the debate. Instead, reigniting fierce debates around it. Pro and anti-slavery settlers rushed to Kansas, hoping to outnumber each other and sway the vote. This led to violent clashes between the two sides, known as Bleeding Kansas. Instead of uniting the country, the Kansas-Nebraska Act only deepened... Was that John Brown? Hold on. Like, <laughs> it just looks like... <laughs> Instead of uniting the country, the Kansas-Nebraska Act only deepened divisions, stoking the fires that culminated in the Civil War. He thought making concessions uh, to Southerners was what was necessary to preserve the Union. Number three, Richard Nixon, the Watergate scandal and resignation. This one, because people talk about it now, when people talk about Watergate now, I don't think people view, view it now nearly as scandalous as people did that like back then, like election tampering or whatever it is. Now it's just like expected and everyone just throws it around now with their tapping and their, their uh, you know, each other's uh, messages and they're messing with votes and they're getting foreign powers involved. Like now it's just like it's been thrown around so much that maybe nobody cares. But I think the biggest thing about this was that actually led to the resignation of the president. And would you see something like a water? Do you think today a thing like a Watergate, which a lot of people would like to say about the laptop and <laughs> the missing emails and like all this stuff. And none of those led to any resignations when, you know, brought up whether they were end up being true or not. It's like, I don't, it almost seems like today you would not see a resignation for something like this than you would have, ba say, back in the 70s, like with Nixon. Do you think that is something that has changed in American policy is today scandals are just not seen as very scandalous anymore? Few things are as humiliating for a U.S. president as resigning from office. Richard Nixon was the first to experience this due to his involvement in the Watergate scandal. Yeah, nobody's we have a mystery story out of Washington. He resigned. Five people have been arrested and charged with breaking into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee in the middle of the night. Nixon was largely popular during his first term, but to ensure his re-election in 1972, his administration and campaign orchestrated the wiretapping of the Democratic Party headquarters. However, the men sent to do the job were caught red-handed and eventually linked to Nixon's campaign. Desperate to hide his administration's involvement, Nixon tried to obstruct the investigation. This was revealed by his own taped recordings, leading him to resign rather than face impeachment. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Ironically, Nixon had already secured re-election in one of the largest landslides in history, which made the whole fiasco pointless. Number two, <laughs> uh, you see it now it's like impossible. And like, I don't think people even try to try to or try to hide campaign strategies and stuff anymore. Campaign strategies and campaigning is so digital and wide open now that it's almost like you don't even need to do that stuff anymore. <laughs> and if you do, people will deny and, and, you know, do whatever. So, all right. Okay. We are in the top now. Right. So, um, was that? Three. Franklin D. Okay, so that was three, two. We're going to have number one here in a second. Now, this looks like internment of Japanese Americans, which has definitely been uh, seen as a, a very much a black eye to the, the, the Roosevelt uh, presidency. But it's good. Uh, right now, I'm wondering what, what you're going to think. Um, are there things that aren't going to be on here? Uh, that you can already tell that aren't going to be on here that you thought would be. You know, one of the things that came up in last uh, uh, one of the debates or in the debate last night that prompted me doing this video was President Trump said that the exit from Afghanistan was maybe the most embarrassing moment in American history of the way that that ended. So that was something uh, I was wondering, and, and you can think about too, um, is it embarrassing enough? Do you think that it matches up with these other things we've seen on this list? Roosevelt, internment of Japanese Americans. Following Japan's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, public opinion in the U.S. slowly began to turn against Japanese Americans. 
To address fears of further Japanese attacks or sabotage, President Franklin D. Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066. Motivated by vocal outcries I always forget that, from the number and the military officials, order. FDR signed Executive Order 9066, empowering the U.S. Army to designate areas from which any or all persons may be excluded. This a lot of that in the Western the US government states. To forcibly remove and relocate people of Japanese descent more more Japanese to internment camps. As a result, about 120,000 Japanese Americans, many of them U.S. citizens, were uprooted from their homes and forced to live under harsh conditions, simply due to baseless fears of espionage. Years later, the Ronald Reagan administration officially apologized to the former detainees for this grave injustice and paid $20,000 in reparations to each survivor. It would take over 40 years before President Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, paying reparations to each victim of internment. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so about to get number one, my, just my commentary on that uh, would be that this is one of those things that was seen as embarrassing a lot later than at its time, because it was something a lot of people thought because uh, uh, it was at wartime. And like we said, during wartime, people will act differently and believe things differently than they would. And they thought it was of national security, of urgent national security to be able to keep an eye basically on Japanese Americans as they were dealing with that horrible war in the Pacific there. And yes, now today, again, it's looked back as so negatively because you know these people were, people had nothing to do with that. And they were a lot of them, they're like US citizens. But now, yeah, it's such a black eye and people are like, hey, you know, you're putting in people in camps, like uh, uh, civilians into camps, just like the enemies that the Americans are fighting in World War II, you know, do that. But yes, it's definitely one of those things really, really left a black eye for the Americans in, in World War II channel all right what do you think is gonna be number one notified about our latest videos you have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them if you're on your phone make sure you go into settings and switch on your notifications number one andrew jackson the trail of tears in the early 1800s Tensions ran high between Native Americans and white settlers over the ownership of indigenous lands in the South, which were ideal for cotton farming. The U.S. government signed a treaty that guaranteed that Cherokee land would be off limits to white settlers forever. These settlers found a powerful ally in President Andrew Jackson. In 1830, Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act, authorizing the forceful displacement of indigenous tribes from their ancestral lands. Between 1830 and 1850, about 60,000 Native Americans were removed from their homes and marched over a thousand miles to designated Indian territory across the Mississippi River. Now, displacement of indigenous peoples was not unique to that, right? That, that happened all throughout all of this, this expansion, uh, Western expansion and, and expansion of our country. And that, that was, you know, obviously the, like so terrible. And what made the trail of tears, especially like one notch higher than that is how brutal this essential evac, essentially this evacuation was with how deadly it was on top of already these people being removed from their lands. And is yeah easily one of the biggest black eyes and maybe the most universally accepted black eyes that people don't even I, th I feel like put as much context into say like the concentration camps for Japanese Americans where people were like eh, it was wartime or doing what you thought was good for the country and stuff but more universally condemned probably is the trail of tears and probably anything on this list I don't know what do you guys think about that thousands of Native Americans we think the most universally in Georgia condemned and other thing. states across the South that we've Many seen on the were list. shackled in chains and forced to walk at gunpoint more than 1,000 miles west. Referred to as the Trail of Tears, this journey was brutal and left thousands dead from disease, exposure, and starvation. Today, many scholars view it as an act of genocide and ethnic cleansing against Native Americans. Which of these appalling moments left you shaking your head in disbelief? Let us know in the comments below. I did not have 
sexual relations with that woman. Had to, had to let that play. All right, final thoughts. All right, I asked a ton of questions throughout the video. Hopefully you were able to uh, respond to those as kind of the video is going on. But I want to circle back to why I reacted this um, at this at this time. There, going back to that debate, okay, that just happened between President Trump, President Biden, um, a lot of things that they were saying about each other were hyperbolic in the way that they're saying it's the most embarrassing thing. If it was Trump, it was like, you know, he was saying that it was, you know, it's the worst presidency of all time or, you know, the worst this and that. So the Afghanistan, right, the, the exit out of Afghanistan, that was the most embarrassing thing, you know, that happened in American history. Then you would, then you heard counters of that where Biden was saying that, like, you were the worst president in history. You were, you, you had all this, these, these, you're only president with all these legal uh, troubles and convictions. So you have that and like you're so you're like you're embarrassing as, as a person and stuff. And it's it's again, it's all very hyperbolic and very uh, political in the way that they do that. But then, you know, one of the things that, that capped all this off was the performances, right? People have gone after Biden so hard. This was truly an embarrassing moment where literally, I mean, it's within 24 hours of the debate that I'm 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 uh, recording this. People saying that, like, it could it could change the whole rest of this election phase that, you know, there's people that are saying that it was such an embarrassing thing that it could lead to pressure being put by the Democratic Party to have Biden step aside that say, hey, this was so bad that you may have ruined the chances that you have to winning this election. And again, the election's not very far away. It's end of June right now. The election's coming in November, and it could still happen because you haven't had you know the um, the the conventions yet for this. Nothing's you know official and uh, for anything for these parties yet. So, anyways, so with all of these things that are being uh, alleged about embarrassing moments that you're hearing these candidates talk about, and then the performance from the debate, where do you think those lie in context uh, with the most embarrassing moments in American history for specifically with this? video from presidents. Can they stack up to that? Is it, of course, too early to tell? Is it just too recent, you know, to talk about those things? But the events, the things that they are actually accusing of each other, say, pull out of Afghanistan, or again, these convictions, this kind of stuff, or maybe handling of COVID, you know, uh, where do you think those things stack up in this list? Because this list didn't cover any of those things other than the, the, the Trump guilty verdicts, you know. Anyway, what do you think about that? Um, love to hear your comments down below and of course a civil manner. Be civil to each other, of course. And with that, we'll see you all next time.